it's March 6th, 2008, and I've got this splitting headache. And I'm lying on the couch trying to get some sleep. And just as I start to fade off, I see this picture, a very clear image in my mind of a photograph of Michelangelo's Moses. And it's crystal clear, and it hits me real hard. Moses is, is set way down too low. Moses looks stupid, buried beneath the facade of the tomb of Pope Julius. But I'm not sure it can be fixed. So with my head beating, I get up, go to the computer, call up the image, and indeed, Moses is sitting there in the doorway of the tomb, which isn't even a real doorway any longer. It's doesn't open up onto anything. It's just a wall tomb. It was supposed to be a freestanding structure, a big building, 24 feet by 36 feet by three stories high. And over the course of 40 years of constant haggling with the Pope's family, it gets reduced and reduced and reduced until now it's just this panel, big panel on the wall. And there's no place to put the Moses except in the doorway. He's too big to go anyplace else. So it's a mess. He knows it. He walks away from it. Everybody else is happy. He's not. So Moses is stuck in this doorway, and there is a lot of headspace between the top of his head and the top of the doorway itself. So I take a pretty simple photo processing program, and I cut out Moses, and I have raised him up to what I figured is probably about two and a half feet, put him in that doorway, just lift it up a little bit so that his head is at least taller than the heads of the two figures on the other side, Rachel on one side and Leah on the other. And it looks better. And not only that, the figure looks bigger. It looks strikingly bigger. It's an optical illusion. And so there it is. And the next thought is, A, we've got to do it. And B, this is, this is one of the great pieces of Western art. And what I, this, this American from Pennsylvania, I want to take the Moses off of there, put in a big block of granite, and put the Moses back up higher so that when people come to see him, you have to look up at him a little bit, not straight at him. Now, is this legitimate? Well, first of all, it's a piece of sculpture. We move sculpture around all the time in galleries and museums, curators make decisions about where you're going to put a particular piece of sculpture. What kind of pedestal? Is it going to be against the wall in the middle of the room? All kinds of decisions, which are powerful aesthetic decisions. But in this case, the Moses is, seems integrated into the, the tomb in such a way that moving it around feels like it's some sort of redesigning of what's supposed to be a fully integrated composition by the great artist of the last 2,000 years. But it isn't. It's not, a, that's to say, it's not a coherent aesthetic decision. This is not what Michelangelo intended. It's what he got stuck with after 40 years of being driven crazy by this family. Finally, he brings in what he's got he sticks it there, he carves a couple of additional pieces, he wipes his hands and he walks away. This is not how he expected it to look. In particular, he didn't expect the figure of Moses to be seen straight on like we see him now. We were supposed to see Moses as he would have looked 16 feet in the air on top of the first story of this big three-story high mausoleum. So we're supposed to be looking at him way up like that. This is a cast of a Moses sitting in a parking lot somewhere. And even these guys had the brains to put it up higher than we see it in Rome. And if we take this image, because we have the angle, and superimpose it on one of the drawings of the tomb, we get some kind of an idea of what the feeling of this piece would be and how big the whole tomb structure would have been.
if it had been realized properly in the first place. And he really needs to be centered properly for compositional purposes in that doorway. About 30 inches puts him nicely in that doorway, which is serving now as a <coughs> sculpture niche. It puts his head above Rachel and Leah, gives a nice triangular composition, which is standard in Renaissance art. Three figures, central figures, tall and important, Moses, Jesus, Mary, with two secondary figures, usually the saints, on either side, lower. So there's a triangular shape. That's how it was done. That's what should be done here. And it would be easy to do. And it could easily be undone. We're not talking about a permanent change to a piece of artwork. If in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, a new generation comes in and thinks, well, this was terrible, they can put him back. Now, why would the church bother to do this? Well, apart from aesthetic reasons and art historical reasons, there's just tourist dollars. The church of San Pietro in Vincoli is not really heavily touristed. One time I was in there virtually by myself. Now, when you compare this to when you go to the Academia in Florence, the lines are, are wrapped around the block. By changing the composition, you're going to create, you're bound to create a controversy. Somebody's going to hate this. This is going to be in the papers. There's going to be an outcry. Art experts are going to lose their minds, which is great. It draws attention. People are going to want to come and see. Now, would Michelangelo have liked this? And that's a fair question. When you're talking about an artist's work, you have to ask, is this consonant with their purpose to begin with? Would they have liked the change? Is this a change they would have made if they could have, but ran out of time? So if Michelangelo would have appeared 500 years later and look at what we were doing, he'd think, well, okay, that's, that's better at least. That's better. If he could have made this fix, if it had crossed his mind at the time, if he hadn't been so burnt out by it, he might have said, yeah, we need another block of stone. Let's get, let's get the figure up higher in the air a little bit, but he was just done. He was done. He put that thing there, we're through. And it suffered ever since. So he'd approve of us doing this. Now, does it matter? I think it matters. I think it changes a lot of what we know about Michelangelo. And the politics and the, and the economics of the time shaped his life. They prevented projects, big projects, from happening. They caused other projects, which probably would not have happened to, like the Sistine Ceiling. He never would have painted that if he hadn't had a gun to his head. But once he realized that he wasn't going to be able to finish the tomb of Julius, at least not when he wanted to, and he got this opportunity to paint the ceiling, he thought, okay, you can mess with me, watch this. That's useful. That's, it's important to see how creative people, scientists or poets across the range, are affected by and shaped by not just the big cultural forces like the Renaissance, but very specific things like how much does this paint cost? And to some extent, maybe we can incorporate that into our own lives when we're trying to evaluate what we want to do with the limited amount of time we have and the limited amount of resources. What can we actually get done? Okay. So what I need to know is, who do I talk to? Who do I call? How do we get this done? Because it can be done, and I want.